Today, I'm diving into the world of network attached storage with the Synology 923 Plus. And I'm gonna upgrade the absolute hell of this, then configure it and speed run a conceptual NAS silencer. In the interest of full disclosure, Synology provided me with this unit and said, the only requirement is to make a video about it. They didn't have any talking points or editorial oversight, so every single word of this video is my own, as it should be. Just a few quick words about my background so you can understand my skill level. I am not a network engineer, but I have configured managed switches through SSH. So I am probably on the little bit more technical side of networking. I do not enjoy server management. I am a UX developer, so I enjoy making things look pretty and I'm comfortable with a command line. I am not a server guy though. Like many people who dabble in the digital arts with music and media, storage is always at a premium, especially now that my hobby is making YouTube videos. Right now, my three years of YouTube videos and their respective source footage is stored on a single 14 terabyte hard drive in a Terramaster USB case, and I'm running out of space. I'm near the point where it's either keep buying piles of external hard drives or get serious. That brings us to network attached storage, aka NAS, which I'm sure most of my audience already knows about, but on the off chance that someone does not not, NASs are servers geared towards storing files. Synology is basically the premium option in this space and it really shows. After using this for about a month, the analogy that jumps out to me is that Synology is basically the Apple of NAS solutions because of their incredibly easy to use software, which I'll be demonstrating the setup and some applications. <laughs> it's surprisingly easy. Much like Apple, Synology is not the cheapest option and you'll probably get more hardware bang for your buck elsewhere. But my audience being primarily iPhone and Mac users understands that software can make or break hardware, and you'll get the best results when the company makes both the hardware and software. Let's start with the hardware. The configuration they generously sent me is the 923 Plus with two 12 terabyte drives and the 10 gigabit ethernet upgrade with four gigabytes of RAM. Powering this is an AMD R1600 dual core 2.6 gigahertz CPU. Synology has its own line of branded components that are certified for maximum compatibility and reliability like these two 12 terabyte hard drives. This is useful for people running mission critical operations who want a guarantee. If I were buying this for a business, I'd be inclined to pay for the white glove service of pure Synology components, but I'm a hobbyist YouTuber on a budget just looking for a mid-tier solution. What they sent me is certainly enough to get started, but before even powering it on, I'm upgrading it. Normally I don't spend much time showing the upgrading process, but the Synology is mostly a toolless design. The hard drive caddies do not require screws. Just pop them out, snap on the rails, and then slide them back in. I'm also dropping in two additional 18 gigabyte Iron Wolf Pro HDDDs to complement the two 12 terabyte HDDDs. Installing RAM as an upgrade is just dead simple. I dropped in 16 gigabytes more of RAM, bringing it up to a total of 20 gigabytes of ECC RAM. Funnily enough, the RAM I bought was from OWC, aka MaxSales.com. This is probably overkill for my needs, but if you're really hardcore, I've read you can max out the 923 plus beyond its listed max of 32 with 64 gigabytes of RAM. Flip over the NAS and on the bottom are two NVMe slots. Again, these are entirely toolless. I am dropping in a two terabyte NVMe. This is absolutely one of the easiest computers I've ever worked on. I'm specking this up to be the NAS I've always wanted. Sure, I'd have loved to kit this out with just 20 gigabyte hard drives, but this is enough for now. Getting this up and going is easier than I would have guessed. Just plug it in and go to finds.synology.com, then the device will show up. Then it's just a matter of needing to page through the usual user agreements to start the installation. After that, it's just waiting for it to be completed. Next, it's time to create a master password and you'll probably want to create a Synology account so you can easily access the device from the internet. You'll even get to pick out your own URL for your device. Then finally, one last screen and we're ready to move forward. This is where stuff gets cool. Synology runs its own Linux-based operating system called Disk Station Manager, aka DSM, and it's operated via the web browser with a really polished GUI, which is basically the most advanced web app I've ever used outside of maybe perhaps Figma. Since this is my first launch, I'm being bombarded with messages to configure 2FA. After that, it's time to create a storage pool. I'm sure some of you noticed I have mixed hard drive sizes. I have two 12 terabyte drives and two 18 terabyte drives. Synology bragged to me that you could use multiple hard drive sizes with this proprietary Synology Hybrid RAID or HSR technology. HSR is much like RAID 5, but you can use multiple disk sizes. In a RAID 5 cluster, I'd be limited to using only 12 of the 18 terabytes on the two larger hard disks. Whereas with HSR, 
RSR, I can make use of the larger drive's extra space. Like RAID 5, any single drive in my array could fail and I'd still have redundancy. This is significantly better than my previous solution, which was a single 14 terabyte hard drive. Synology on its website has a really useful RAID calculator. I'll populate it with my 12 and 18 terabyte drives with RAID 5 and we can see that I'd be out 10.9 terabytes but if I use SHR, all the drive space can be used. I can also compare space usage between SHR and SHR2, which uses two drives dedicated to redundancy. You can see that SHR2 is not making use of the entire drives. SHR2 most likely would make better use of the hard drives if I had more drives in my cluster. I'm gonna go with SHR for now. If I need to expand in the future, Synology sells a five bay SAT expansion in the form of the DX517. If you're like me, you wanna go back to the calculator and see how nutty you can go. Just by adding five 18 terabyte drives, I'd be sitting on over 100 terabytes of storage, even with HSR2. What I'm getting at is there's plenty of expansion in my future. Back to the installation. At this point, the OS will complain about not using an official SSD, but I'm pretty sure the Samsung 980 Pro is more than sufficiently reliable. The configurator will give you a pick of file systems, but BTRFS is really the way to go because of its fault tolerance. You can choose encrypt or not, and I went with encryption. After generating the encryption key, I can now format my drives. Now that the storage pool is ready, it's time to configure the SSD for cache. First format it and then create a SSD cache. This caught me off guard because you need two SSDs for read and write caching. This is the only thing in this entire process that annoyed me because this is a bit of overkill. I'd be willing to risk some data loss in the event my SSD failed because I'm pretty sure the hard drives will fail long before the two terabyte Samsung 980 Pro does. To get the full benefits of a SSD, I ended up buying a second two terabyte SSD for read and write cache. This really stung, but Synology requires a RAID 1 array for SSD caching. SSD caching enhanced enhances the performance by using the SSDs to store frequently accessed data, thereby speeding up read and write operations and overall system responsiveness. Pro tip time everybody, I learned my configuration is absolutely wanton overkill. I ended up running the SSD cache benchmark utility and I found that for my use case, I probably could have gotten away with 512 or one terabyte SSDs and I really didn't need to buy as high end of SSDs as I did. While I couldn't find direct information on the PCIe bus speeds, it appears that they are PCI 3.0 but run at 1x. That means SSD read and writes are capped at 1 gigabyte a second. The Ryzen embedded R1600 is only PCI 3.0, so that's not really a surprise, but it did list 8 lanes, so I kind of expected more speed. Only later did I discover the performance metrics on the website, and they list the SSD performance for the 923 as about 1.1 gigabytes per second. At this point, I'm nearly done, but first I need to open up FileStation and create a network volume. This is really straightforward, and I don't need to encrypt because I already am encrypting the volume itself. I'm going to add in enable data checksum for increased file integrity, but I'm going to skip file compression as this is for my YouTube videos and not deep storage. At this point, you could configure user permissions for volume so you can create access controls. Okay, finally I need to go to the control panels and file services and I need to enable SMB to share the volume to Mac and Windows. And the helpful UI will let you know the address on your network. At this point, it's finally good to go. I can go to my Mac and connect to server with the login and password. It'll mount my Synology and from here I can start moving data into my storage pool. And with that, I'm finally done setting up the Synology to be a file server. At this point, you can poke around with the UI and you can check to see the diagnostics with the CPU and RAM usage in the resource manager. That's neat, right? But the Synology is just so much more than this. It has an entire app ecosystem. For instance, I can easily create virtual machines. Just install Virtual Machine Manager and it only takes about 30 seconds to install. Then it's a matter of using an ISO to install an operating system. It didn't take me terribly long to install Ubuntu as a virtual machine. I have the power of a Linux VM at my fingertips at all times now. You can even run Windows this way. Interestingly, Windows virtualization makes use of QMU. Nothing quite beats the experience of having to decline Microsoft shovelware in a Windows 10 virtualized environment. Out of more curiosity, I downloaded Geekbench 6 and decided to run it. When setting up this virtual machine, I gave it access to two cores and eight gigabytes of RAM. Inside the VM, the performance is roughly that of a Core M found in a MacBook 2015. That's pretty slow, but then again, that's not the point of this machine. And to be completely absurd, I installed Steam so I could install Doom 2, which resulted in quite possibly the most miserable gaming experience. But to answer the most important question, 
Yes, the Synology D923 Plus can run Doom. This is a virtualized environment, but I'm still making the executive call that this counts. Ubuntu, on the other hand, seems to run a little bit smoother than Windows. This shouldn't be a big surprise as it's a lighter operating system. At this point, I'm playing Browserception as I'm surfing the internet on my virtual machine hosted on my NAS through a browser window. Running a GUI really isn't the point, rather you could host VMs for server tasks. I feel like this needs to be called out when you're operating a virtual machine, it's using a VNC connection, whereas DSM does not, so it doesn't have the choppiness of a virtual machine. Want Docker? You can install that too. Docker is a bit much for this video, maybe later I'll do a shorter video about running Docker on the Synology if there's enough interest. Still, this is just incredibly cool. Are you fed up with services like GitHub potentially stealing your code to train AI, or do you feel like being the world's worst developer and committing your .env files and your API keys directly into your code base? Well, you can run your own private Git server with this Synology with minimal friction. They also offer a suite of software that behaves like popular cloud storage solutions. You can create your own private cloud with apps like Moments for Photo Storage, but I'm just too deep into Apple's ecosystem to really explore this one. If you're interested, there's entire videos about using it for photo storage. Same goes for DS Audio for music, which has iOS support and CarPlay support. If iTunes Match ever goes away, I'll be diverting to this service. And it doesn't end there as well because you can also host your own email and web server and so on. With a NAS, you can own your own digital life. I've always dreamed of having my own Plex server, and now I do. Again, installing software is just a point-click affair. In fact, my old movie collection exists on a single external hard drive. I plugged it into my 923's USB port, installed XFAT drivers, and I was able to read the drive and copy over the collection using the GUI. I won't bore people with the details, but now I can access my entire movie collection from my Apple TV, iPhone, my computers, and I've shared it with my family members. Now to the negatives. There aren't many, but the price might put some people off, but realistically, you could buy a Synology and populate it with hard drives at the price of some of Apple's storage options. Also, it lacks an HDMI port, which would be nice if you wanted to use this as a standalone computer, and the CPU could be a little faster. The mandatory dual SSDs for write caching is overkill, and having to buy a second SSD annoyed me. I'm able to get about 450 megabytes a second using 10 gigabit Ethernet, which is a bit lower than I had hoped. I was really hoping to push the limits of 10 gigabit Ethernet. That said, it's faster than my TerraMaster enclosure, which means it's fast enough to edit video off of. Although I really don't care because my Mac Pro 2019 has 12 terabytes of NVMe storage, so this isn't a necessity. Another pro tip, for anyone buying one of these who wants SSD performance, I'd personally just suggest combing eBay for used 500 gigabyte Samsung 970 Evos and calling it a day. You're not risking any data loss if an SSD dies because of the enforced write caching. There's really no benefit to buying the latest and greatest NVMEs with this thing. Also, as a general note, if you're going the route of caching, what you're really after is write caching because read caching only benefits the frequently used files, whereas the write cache is useful for any file transfers to the NAS. Again, caching is totally optional. And if we're being totally honest, I probably wouldn't notice it that much. The last complaint is 10 gigabit ethernet should be standard on this device, and it can really make use of the additional bandwidth. Switches are now very affordable, I run 10 gig in my office. My final complaint is the only one I really considered an issue. I kept hearing this higher pitched hum that really annoyed me. Most people just stick this thing in a closet or basement, thus out of earshot, but I don't have that option. It's literally stuck in my home office. So, as a concept, I decided to create my own prototype of a silencing box, basically sticking the NAS in a pile of sound deadening material, making sure it has enough airflow. I was worried that this might not work as it could overheat the NAS, so I went ultra cheap to build a proof of concept. For this build, I bought dirt cheap sound deadening foam, acoustic foam, a USB fan from ACfinity, which is quasi name brand, and a cheap cardboard box from Ikea. I did this as fast as I could by eyeballing the entire job and it shows this is not my finest handiwork. I also learned that this cheap acoustic foam is incredibly sticky and I managed to get some stuck on my hand. The box turned out to be almost the perfect size, but it was a hair small. The Synology fits in snugly. However, I encountered one strange issue. The USB fan wouldn't work with this Synology's USB port, so I ended up using the USB port found on my router. Then it was time to put my experiment to use. Sonically, it reduced the noise, mostly the higher pitch sound which I had hoped for. Hey, this is Greg from the future, and I just figured I should point this out, that this fan does have multiple fan settings. You have a low, high, off, 
After three weeks of use, the temperature barely changed, and I'm confident I could build a real box out of wood, buy name brand acoustic deadening material from someone like Dynamat or Soundskins, and then just make this thing really quiet without putting it at risk. Now to close this whole thing out, the Synology 923 Plus is probably my favorite piece of tech I've played with since my M1 Max. Basically I have my own private cloud computer that I can access via the internet wherever I am. All my files are now accessible regardless of which computer I'm using. You can even access your files via iOS using their apps. There are competing solutions like Unraid or from vendors dipping their toes in the water, but Synology has the Apple advantage of its own OS and its own hardware. I need to mention that Synology does have one competitor that's very similar with their own hardware and OS, and that's QNAP. It doesn't really make any sense for me to compare these two as I do not own or use any QNAP products, and there's quite a bit of content that covers the differences between the two companies. I feel obligated to mention that QNAP's reputation isn't that of Synology due to high profile ransomware attacks in the past, but it's on a bit of a redemption arc. Thus far, I haven't experienced any issues. Everything just works. While I have a tinkerer's mindset when it comes to old computers, I just don't enjoy server management. I want it to be reliable and pain-free. Now for a bit of a tangent, because inevitably people will ask me about this. This is a Terramaster D4 300. All it is is a four drive bay USB-C case. It's not hardware RAID, it's not NAS, it has zero additional features. Literally, you plug in your hard drives and it'll show up in your OS like normal. All it has on the back is a single USB-C case and of course, power supply for the hard drives. So there's not much to be said other than it was about $150 now it's about 170, making it a little less attractive. It's more convenient than just having a pile of externals. <laughs> oh yeah, when I first started YouTube, I almost made a dedicated video about this, then realized it'd be like two minutes long. While I did receive this unit from Synology, I invested $800 of my own money into this in the form of SSDs, hard drives, and RAM. There's just no world where this video breaks even or even makes a quarter of that back. I only bring this up because I would have not spent this kind of money upgrading it if I didn't love the product. Even while editing this video, I upgraded the RAM to 32 gigabytes as the OS will make use of free RAM for caching. I'm definitely buying into sunk cost fallacy as I already sunk so much money into the SSDs might as well go all the way with the RAM. What I'm trying to get at is I'm all in on the Synology and it's going to be part of my life from now on. I already know for a fact you'll see it in future videos from me. Honestly, I wish I would have invested in a NAS years ago because now that I have one, it generally improves my life. The DSM operating system is the real hero here. It's easy to use, stylish, and just check out how cool the responsive behavior is when I resize the browser window. That might not seem like much, but the UX developer in me really appreciates it. This is my favorite piece of tech I've picked up in a long time as I'm storing my data with more confidence, I have greater access to it, and it's even faster than my current solution for storing old YouTube footage. I have a feeling one day when I retire my Mac Pro 2019, I won't replace it. Instead, I'll just have a laptop and a network attached storage solution. I'd like to thank my Patreons for keeping this mid-roll ad free.